All right, let's get into this word. Jeremiah 18, we will begin reading at verse 1 and concluding at verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, concluding at verse 4. I want to say this. I didn't say this in the last service, and I don't say this to get kudos. It's the God on this truth. It's such an honor. It's a blessing. Um, to have a wife that supports you, pushes you, stands there with you, wipe your tears when you're crying, hold your head up when your head is down, let you lean on her ever so often. So if y'all don't mind, can we give it up for Lady Nikki for all she does, whether you see it or not. I, um, I'm not in trouble. I'm not, I'm not saying that because... <laughs> You know, be trying to talk yourself into a good place when you know that's I really do love and appreciate her. And uh, and if it wasn't for her, I don't know where I'll be. And I and I, I sincerely mean that. Jeremiah 18, beginning of verse one, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. Someone say again. Into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. I want to use as a subject today a question. If you don't mind looking at your neighbor and say, neighbor, what is God doing with my life? Look at your neighbor on the other side because they act like they didn't get it. Say, neighbor, what is God doing with my life? That question is a very loaded one, and normally that question comes because we find ourselves in a place of confusion. We find ourselves perplexed, not understanding what's going on because we have envisioned our lives to be one way, and when we look at where we are, we find out that sometimes it seems to be in a place of contradiction where you feel like you should be the head, but you feel like the tail. Or you, you, you've heard him say that you will be above, but yet you feel like you're beneath. And it doesn't seem like you're blessed in nobody's city, in nobody's field. And even though you've prayed and done everything right, just, just not making sense. And you can ask God, God, really, what's going on here? What's going on in my life? But I, I think it's important for us to understand that as God does uh, move in our lives that he has a plan for everything he does. He allows certain things to happen. He, he orchestrates certain things, not that he is the originator of it, that he had ill intentions, but he knows how to manage what happens. God is so masterful that even when something bad happens, he can still guarantee, guarantee, guarantee that you still will come out on top because all things work together for our good. So God is in control. At the same time, we must understand that God is not only in control, God is clear. God knows what he's doing with your life. Recently, uh, my son and I were in a, a project. We was working on a project for him that we were given a while ago. And so this last few days, we started working on it. And so I read the instructions, read everything, you know, that I was supposed to read on, on the page and we went to the store. We bought product. We put everything together and then Went to the kitchen, and my wife said, uh, do you have the rubric? And I said, rubric? I said, <laughs> I said, I read the instructions on the page. She said, no, it's, it's another page. There's a rubric. So by this time, I'm like, oh, my God. I done did all this work, uh, cut up all this stuff, uh, the sim uh, uh, pulled things apart, took th things apart, and now I'm about to find out that I did all this work for nothing. Thanks be unto God. We good. <laughs> Didn't have to take anything apart. But isn't it interesting that I was in the middle of something, already executed, already made plans, already started putting stuff together, already started gluing stuff in, all this other th stuff for the project, and got into the middle of it to find out that there was a rubric. Wouldn't it have been easier for me to know that on the front end? Yeah. And sometimes in life, we start off things and get in the middle of it, and then we find out there's a rubric that we were supposed to be living by. There was something that, in addition to, to, to what we started with, 
that if we would have had it, it would have made things easier. God is clear to the point that God knows the end that he's going to take you. That's what he told Jeremiah, that you were, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. And he says at the end of that, and I've brought you to an expected end. In other words, I know where I'm taking you. I know where I'm going. God knows where he's taking you. Even though you may not know the directions, he knows where he's taking you. The other day I was in Charlotte. And uh, it was on the phone, and, uh, and I, I put the phone, you know, we were at the crossroads. And so I wanted a Chick-fil-A, and I wanted a Starbucks. And so where I was, I said, where's the nearest Starbucks? And so I was in walking distance. It was around the corner, real easy. That was easy. Then I said to Siri, I said, where is the nearest Chick-fil-A? And so they said the nearest Chick-fil-A was about two blocks up. So I'm walking two blocks. I get there. I'm looking. I see no Chick-fil-A. I stop. I look at the, at the phone. It says, you are here. I said, there's no Chick-fil-A here. So I turned it off, went back to it. I said, Siri, where is the nearest Chick-fil-A? Then it made me walk back two blocks <laughs> back the other way because Chick-fil-A was actually by Starbucks. It was just in another building. What, what I'm saying is when you clear, you don't have to backtrack. When, when, you, when you know where you're going, you don't have to walk in fear. You don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be frustrated because you know where you're going. It's only when you have to follow the leading of something else that can make you nervous. God doesn't want you nervous. He wants you to know he has everything under control. The Bible says in Genesis, he speaks to the earth. The, right? The earth is without form and void. It is full of darkness. It has no shape and it's empty, much like this piece of Plato that I have here. The earth is without shape, without form. It's empty. And some of us, this is what our lives look like. It's out of shape and it's empty. But the thing that God does is God speaks to it. He speaks order to something that's out of order. He speaks, he speaks clarity to where there's chaos. And sometimes what you need from God isn't a hug. You need a word. Sometimes you don't need other things that you think you need. Sometimes you just need to get in God's presence to hear what his word says about it. And the people who understand the power of his word will understand where I'm going. It's when you're in a cave like Elijah that I taught on Wednesday and then the word brings you out of that cave. It's when you read like Psalms 119 where the whole psalm actually is about the word of God. And he says, uh, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Later on, he says, deal bountifully with your servant that he may obey your word. In other words, it's his word that gets us through. And when you have a word from God, it'll help you get through some stuff. When you have a word, it'll give you peace in the middle of the storm. When you have a word, it'll allow you to, to get your bearings together because you have a word. So here it is. We see where God speaks to the earth, he says, uh, let there be light and there's light. He says, let there be a moon and there's a moon. He said, let there be stars and there's a star. And God begins to break down or begin to work on the earth, but he never touches anything. Everything that comes into existence is spoken just off of a word. God doesn't consult with anybody. He makes what he makes, look at it and say, that's good. He does it so much that God is so confident in what he does that he celebrates his own work. At some point, you you have to be able to do the work you do. Look at what you did. Pat yourself on the back and say, you know what? I did that right there. You have to be able to be your own cheerleader sometimes. You have to provide your own self-support because sometimes other people won't get it, especially if you're looking at that where I want you to say something good to me. I want you to say I did a good job. If you don't tell me a good job, I'm going to tell me I did a good job. If you don't say that was great, I'm going to tell me that was great because sometimes you got to provide your own gas. For your own car. You're not hearing what I'm saying. I don't need you to fuel me. I'll fuel myself. So God says, he, he, he says, let there be. And there was. So he says, let there be water. And water appeared. And he put the fish in the water. He, said, he separated the water from the land. And he put the seeds in the ground. And vegetation came forth. He says, let there be animals. And animals came. He said, let there be trees. And trees came. He put the cloud in the sky and told it they had orders ever so often to come down and hang out on the ground. But it had to go back up into the sky. It's, it's interesting that he, he, he puts the clouds in the sky. He does everything and put everything in his place. Can I tell you what God did in Genesis 1 and 2? He put everything in order. It never said he changed the shape. It just said he spoke to it. So when we look at everything, what God did is tell the water, don't go no further than this. Rivers come here, mountains go over there, and what we have is order, and order is beauty. 
Order itself is beautiful. No one likes nothing unorganized. You, you want to walk in and it's, and, it's, and it's in order. You want things in place. If you can live in chaos, something wrong with you. If you enjoy that, right, everything out of the place. And that's why we embarrass when people come over to our houses because at that point we're exposed that everything is out of order. That's why you be throwing stuff in the closet. That's why you try to do stuff in a dishwasher at the last minute. That's why you try to do stuff. That's why some of y'all have none of your friends over right now because you know your house is a wreck. But anyway, order is in beauty and beauty is in order. And so when you have beauty, you have order. And when you have order, you have beauty. God puts everything in its place. Then God does something in Genesis chapter 2 that he didn't do in chapter 1, and that is he reaches out of heaven with his own hands, and he picks up dirt, he picks up clay, and he forms man. He didn't form the bird. He didn't form the giraffe. He didn't form the lion. He didn't form the fish. He didn't form the whale. He didn't form the eagle. He didn't form the alligator. He didn't form the snake, but he did form man. Because he's trying to shape you into his image. He's trying to mold you into his image. He knows where he's trying to take you. You don't know where he's trying to take you. It's interesting that he begins to form Adam. He begins to apply pressure. He begins to say he's going to have a head. He's going to have a neck. He's going to have a spine. He's going to have legs, two of them. He's going to have two arms. He's going to have, you know, uh, ten fingers, ten toes. He's going to have two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two ears. And he begins to form Adam according to the image he had in his head. And he forms him. And then when he looks at him, he says, yep, that's it. And then he breathes into him the breath of life. And Adam became a living soul. But God formed him first. The same way God forms the pot in Jeremiah 18. He's trying to form you. Everything you've gone through has been God forming you for what he wants to do. Now, look at this. He says, Jeremiah, I'm talking to you, but I need to say something to you, but I can't say it to you until you get into the right place. There are certain conversations that you can have, but the reality is there's certain things you will never get until you get into the right place. My father used to always tell me when I was younger, son, there's some things I want to say to you, but I can't say it to you right now because you're not ready for it. And I never understood it, but it was really maturity, not locality. Because you can say some stuff to some people and they can't handle it. That's why you can't believe somebody said, tell me, I can handle it. No, you can't because if, you can <laughs> if you can handle it, you're not going to say you can handle it. You're just going to say, say it. Y'all got quiet right there. Do I say, say yeah. so, so when you look at what God's doing, so what happens, he says, go down to the potter's house. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you a work on the wheel. He gets there and he sees a potter working on the wheel, working on something. Somebody say vessel. So he's working on this vessel, but we don't know what he's working on. Only thing we know is he's working. You're like this clay. God been working on you. He's still working on you. He working on all of us. This is why you can't judge nobody. I know you've been saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized. You got Jesus in your life, running for your life. But you're still a mess. I know you've been saved 262 years, but you're still a mess. I know your grandmama was the mother of the church and the founding apostle of whatever it is, but you're still a mess. I don't care what your history is. I don't care where you were born. I don't care your age. I don't care your ethnicity. I don't care. You are a mess. We all are a mess. Okay, let me put it this way. You have issues just like me. All of us in the room have issues. You can dress it up. You can spray cologne on it, and you still a mess, and you still have issues. So isn't it good to know that God, as Erica said earlier, that God still has us or always has us on his mind to the point that look at this. He knows your struggle, but he's still working on you. Yeah. To the fact, some of us should be giving God praise right now because while you were in your mess, he didn't take his hands off you. Because if he would have took his hands off you, you might be dead today. But the fact 
that he kept his hand on you when you were smoking weed. He, he kept his hand on you when you were sleeping around. He kept his hand on you when you were in and out of clubs. He kept his hand out of you when you didn't do right. And the fact that you're still here on your right mind is the fact that God still has his hand on your life. Is there anybody in this room that can say, preacher, I ain't with you with that. God has his hand on my life. I'm so blessed. I don't know how I'm living this blessed. I know how because he reigns on the just and the unjust. The reason why you were able to open your eyes because God has his hand on you. And when you woke up this morning, your eyes should have said, oh, thank God. And your mouth should have said, this is the day that the Lord has made. You should have said, new mercies I see. The reason why you see new mercies is because God keeps holding you in his hand. Because the reality is God taking his hand off you is God leaving you to you. So he says, I'm, I still have you in my, in my hand. But he's working on a vessel. So what happens is why he's working on the vessel, he's working everything out. He says, yep, we're going to do this. He's working on the vessel, but we don't know what's going to happen. Now, right now, in this moment, I have an idea of what I want to do with this, but you don't. So really, the end product is not an announcement. It's a thought. So the reality is you don't know what God is doing because he didn't say it. He just working off the thought. So... Why he's working on the vessel to make it what he's going to make it, something happens. It's marred in the hand of the potter. And, or in other words, there's something wrong with the clay. So God says, oh, I'm trying to work with you. See, I, t I told you to, to leave him alone. Well, I'm going to try. I'm going to keep forming. I, I told you you should have... <laughs> You should have filled out that application for that job six months ago, but you, you still going to stay there. All right. I told you you should have prayed about that before you said yes. So <laughs> I, I'm working on it. I told you, see, because he, he's working around the issue. But then it comes a point when God says, you know what, this issue is an issue and I'm not going to work around it. So even though we've come and we made some progress, I don't like how this is going. So the only thing I can do It start all over. And some of you right now are sitting in your place and you're like, man, I was not expecting my life to be like this at this time. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have my, I had my life planned out. By 30, I was going to have this. By 40, I was going to have that. By 50, I was going to have this. By 60, I would have that. And now you're looking at certain things and some things you've accomplished, but there are other areas where you're saying, man, I didn't really expect this. What happens when God starts the restart button in your life at a time you didn't think he should have pressed it? So now you're sitting here saying, God, really? We got to start all over? Nothing? So some of y'all got new friends. Some of y'all have new ways of thinking, new ways of processing information because God has literally stripped you of what you thought he was building to now build something else. And can I tell you, even though he may be starting over, he's still in control. He knows exactly what you're doing. Some of you right now are walking into new seasons. And literally what's happening, oh my God, some of you had a certain way of thinking. This is your thought process. And God said, that thought process is not going to work in the new season. So I have, to, I have to contradict almost what you've learned to get you to receive what's next. I share this with the church. This is not a kingdom of mine. This is, uh, this is God's church. This is God's doing. Um, I was at a table last week with some pastors, some who, who pastor 14 campuses, nine campuses and different states and different cities. And they're doing phenomenal work. And they were asking me about the church. And I said, yeah, I'm doing three services and this, that, and third. And I just blurted out, yeah, I'll do four or five if I had to, you know, do whatever we had to do. And they stopped and they looked at me and they said, you said what? I said, I would do four or five if I had to. They said, why would you do that? I said, because, you know, you know, people want a small you know, church, and I'm giving my explanation. And they looked at me, and they said this. Hear me. You could do five. You'd be dead in five years. You have to build to live. Wow. 
What? No, if you're going to live, your body can't physically do that. I know you think you can do that, but everybody at the table telling you that is impossible. So what happens when you've built a framework and you stuck on what you have constructed and God says, for where you going? You got to you got to think totally different. For, see, this is the stuff we, it's kind of hard to kind of grasp because really when you start talking about new seasons, you have to talk about new ways of thinking because you can't walk into new seasons with old methods. I told you, I told you this before, I said it again. You can be a hard worker. You can be very detailed to cross every T, dot every I. You can be great with administration. And someone looks at your gift of administration and management and say, you know what? We want to promote you to now be, uh, to oversee several things in the organization. The thing that got you there was your organization. But if you don't change your mindset in your oversight of the projects, what happens is the person who was detailed in one level becomes a micromanager in the next level. So even though you were successful here, you're going to fail here because you still have the old mindset even though you're in a new position. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. So just because what got you that made you successful, you have to change the way you're thinking to embrace the next season. And sometimes God has to start all over with a vessel that's already in work because he's trying to get you to embrace next, not get stuck in yesterday. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when you start saying, I want it, God, and yes, Lord, and whatever you're going to do, be careful when you say yes. You may not know what you're saying yes to, but isn't it good to know that you're saying yes to a God you can trust and to a God who won't let you fail and a God that'll hold you up and a God that'll hold you together and a God that'll keep you focused and a God that give you peace in the middle of a storm and a God who'll give you joy when everything is unsettled because you have a God you can trust. And as long as you're in his hand, you are okay at the end of the day because God is not going to allow anything to harm or to hurt you. This is why you can stand on the promise, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It's good to know that God has so much in store for you that whatever your enemy try to do, it can't even work. Let me tell you, some of you right now will have to be delivered from the, the perception of people. Perception of people. Oh, I had to do that. Because uh, I think a pastor should wear a suit every Sunday. Tie, dress shoes, all that. Well, I, ain't, well, I, ain't wear, I didn't dress up today. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. But somebody in the audience may feel that way. And there's nothing wrong with how you feel about that. Somebody else says, well, you know, he ain't really got to dress up in a suit and tie. I'm good with business casual. Then somebody else is like, well, he can do jeans, T-shirt, and J's. I don't care less. Somebody else on the other side be like, he can preach in flip-flops, shorts, and a T-shirt. I don't care. As long as I get the word, I don't care what he's wearing. Now, that's four different. I think y'all liking the flip-flop part. But, uh, but, the part I'm, but the point I'm trying to make is if I become victim of a perception, I have to make everybody happy. No one can do that. So you have to get clarity from God on your assignment and what you call to do. And if you don't like it, it's cool. Maybe this ain't the place for you. So when you get that mindset, you're okay with saying bye-bye because it ain't personal. Some of us can't make moves because everything is so personal because it's personal because you're locked into their perception. When you are released from their perceptions, you can think whatever you want to think. I have done nothing immoral. I don't have a woman on the other side of town. I am not stealing money from this church. I work every day, go home, love my wife and my kids. I live before God. I try to be as holy as I can. And if you don't like that, then that's a problem with you. But I'm going to wear what I want to wear and I'm going to wear when I feel like wearing it and I'll wear what I want to wear when I want to wear it when I feel like wearing it and if you don't like that oh well you better get that attitude or you're not going to get to the next level are you hearing what I am saying to you this is why some of us are miserable you, you have so many yes people you are the yes man saying yes to everybody and saying no to no one and you're sitting there locked into somebody else's perception and now you become a prisoner 
So what does God have to do? He has to crush it. He has to start all over and says, all right, this is what we're going to do. I'm trying to grow my business. I want to grow my business. I want to, I want to do more of my business. And I, Yeah, okay, let's talk about business. I don't know why I'm here, but since I'm here, let's talk about it. You're trying to bring in more profit margin, okay? That means you have to have more business. Yes, with more business means it's going to be an expense because there's never going to be expansion without expenses. So that means with more business, if you keep thinking you can do the business by yourself, you're going to kill yourself trying to build the business. So that means in the expansion, you have to do additional hires, which means you have to probably charge more because you have more payroll you have to cover outside of yourself. If they can't afford your price, that means they're not your customer. So what you're doing is now you cutting your prices in half because you become hungry for the business. Now you hurting because you working more than what you should be getting paid for. And now you miserable hating what you used to love to do because you have the wrong price on it. Are you, see, yeah, yeah, okay. Listen, oh, somebody who knows nothing about graphics, normally graphics cost you between $50 to $75 per graphic, depending on who you're dealing with. It can be up to $100 just for one graphic. Some of y'all say, that's crazy. I would never spend that much money because you know PowerPoint. Right. <laughs> you know, you thinking clip art. That ain't clip art. That's something totally different. They will sp- believe a graphic artist can spend five hours on something you think is so simple. You're not spending, you're not spending money, listen to me, on the graphic. You're paying for my time for doing the graphic. So, so you don't see five hours. You just see a graphic. So now you stuck trying to push out 20 graphics in two days. You're not going to get that done because you're tired and frustrated. And now you got bad business. Nobody want to do anything with you because you structured your life wrong. If you're going to get it, God has to literally crush the way you are doing it to make you say, I have to do it differently. And whoever don't want your $10 graphic, I don't do $10 graphics. I do $50 graphics. And if you can't pay for that, I need to move to a different place where they're going to pay me what I'm I don't know why I'm talking about business. I don't know who that's for. I hope that helped you out somebody because some of y'all are sitting there broken, frustrated when you should be getting paid more money because you're giving your business to people who ain't got no money. So you're trying to, oh, I can't 25? Ain't no bargaining. Nobody walks in the Target talking about, man, can I get $5 on this shirt? No. <laughs> you don't go to five guys and say, man, can I get $2 off this burger, man? No, I don't want all the fries. You don't, you don't bargain? So why in the world are you allowing people to bargain your gift? I'm not for sale. Neither is my gift. This is why you can't do business with friends. Because they'll use you and abuse you and try to open. I don't do. I don't do hookups. This is what it is. What if God has to change the way you think? No, you can't do it that way. I'm trying to get my life together. I'm trying to get balance. All right. Have you looked at your calendar? No. Oh, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to get in shape. Have you got a trainer? No. Oh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get my money right. <laughs> you talked to your financial advisor. Well, I had a meeting, but I ain't went back. <laughs> y'all ain't helping me. I'm stepping all on y'all toes right now, right? So, 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 God, <laughs> so God has to literally crush what you know. To build what he wants. The question is, are you willing for him to crush it? That in of itself is painful, but it's necessary. This is why you have to trust God in the process, because when you go through certain things, you don't always understand it when you're going through it. Right? You don't understand. God, why am I going to this? This is so hard. I don't understand. And then 10 years later, five years later, six months later, something happens and you look back and you be like, I thank God. 
I went through that. Because if I didn't experience that, I wouldn't be where I am right now. The reason why somebody can come to you and share something and you have sympathy and empathy for them is because you've been there. This is why people, the experience you have is so valuable because this is how you can minister to other people. I know what it means to be struggling financially. I know what it means to be unemployed. I know what it means to be unhappy. I know what it means to be under stress. I know what it means to be under pressure. I know what it means to be a prisoner of possession. I know what it looks like. So when somebody comes, you can say, I know what you're doing. I can really pray for you because other people are praying based on what they read in the book. I'm praying because I know what it feels like to walk through hell and come out of it. This is why you need people around you that have experience and have overcome certain challenges because they really know how to pray because they know how you really feel. So here it is. So he says, we're going to crush this. And we're going to start over. And he makes it another vessel. He makes another vessel. He makes another vessel, same clay, another vessel. Here it is. We don't know what the vessel is. The only thing we know is the vessel. We don't know if it's a cup. We don't know if it's a vase. We don't know if it's a pot. We don't know what it is. We don't have to know. The potter needs to know. So sometimes you just have to sit there and say, God, I trust you. Because the reality is God can't tell us everything he's going to do. If he did, we'll mess it up. Have you ever said something to somebody before? And after you said it, you said, uh, I said too much. Right? And you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Right? And then they go do stuff and you're like, I know I should have said that because they started doing stuff. The same way with God. If he says certain things to us, we'll stop moving on it. That's why the only thing he gave Joseph was a dream of his brothers bowing. Not, not the brothers throwing him into a pit. Not the brothers stripping him of his coat. Not his brothers selling him in slavery. Not the Ishmaelites selling him to Potiphar. Not Potiphar's wife then accusing him of rape. Not him going to jail innocently, innocently for a crime he didn't commit not interpreting somebody else's dream and helping them get out of it, and yet they forget about you after you help them. <sighs> he, Joseph didn't see none of that. If Joseph would have saw all of that, I'm pretty sure. He'd have been like, God, I'm good. I'm going to stay here with my daddy, and I'm going to help count sheep. But I don't want to go to nobody's pit. I don't want to go. I don't want to be nobody's slave. I don't want to be. I don't want to go to jail, accused of something, on, and I have something on my record I never did. What does the story tell us? The story tells us that God can still use you, even if you have something on your record. <laughs> S -s Moses killed a man. He was a murderer. He got something on his record, and God turns around and still uses him to be the greatest pastor, to pastor the largest church ever in the world, and yet he was a murderer, had somebody, he had something on his criminal record. At the end of the day, you've made mistakes in your past, but it does not mean that God cannot use you right now for something great he wants to do in the future. So when people want to turn around and throw their nose at you and roll their eyes and suck their teeth because they think you're beneath them, you, they need to look into a mirror and say, God, I pray you reveal all their mess right now to them because I know they ain't better than me. They just didn't get caught. That's like we, we talk, we, that's like us talking about the young girl who got pregnant. Oh, I can't believe. You know, oh, God. I can't believe she got pregnant. Her, she's, see, she was fast anyway. She fast. She fast. She fast. She fast. But yet your daughter did the same thing because she was... She just, she just didn't end up pregnant, right? So now you think your baby an angel. I remember, I'm going to tell you the story and I'm going to stop. When I, was at, when I went to school, you know, I, I, <clears throat> amen, I didn't do the best. <laughs> and I did some stuff I had, I had no business doing, right? I, I shared that testimony, some of which you can handle, some of which you cannot and which you will not ever know. Um, but I've, sh I've shared some things, right, that I've, I've done, like, just like you did some stuff, right? And so I remember my cousin went home. My older cousin, he was like a role model to me. He went home one day, and my aunt was fussing at him. You should be more like Simeon. 
I know Simeon ain't doing this. And Simeon ain't doing that. And she just singing my praises. And my cousin sitting there like, oh, my God, if you only knew what Simeon was doing. Because what you fussing at me about, he was doing it with me. I just, I just didn't get caught. So at the end of the day, I'm over here looking like an angel and my hands just as dirty as a person who got caught. Don't judge your neighbor for what they've been in. You know you did it too. You just trying to act like you ain't been there. You was there. You was, you, you was right there. So now he pulls up. So here it is. What he does this, he says, you're in my hand. Let me tell you what he does. He, he forms the vessel, but because it's clay, it has to become hard. The way they would make it hard is they would have to put it into a furnace so that the clay could dry and become hard. It would then pull it out of the furnace after a period of time, and then it would decorate it. It would paint it or whatever, and then in some cases put it back into the fire so that the paint or whatever they had would actually stick to the, to the vase or the pot or the pan or whatever or the cup that they decorated. So here it is. So what we see in the text is just the forming, but what we don't see is the fire. Because God, listen to you, so you got to know when to praise God. Because the Bible shares with us how there's a season in which God does certain things, and there's a season in which you receive a, a, a harvest off what's been planted, right? So there's a season where God forms you. Know the season you're in, because after he forms you, then the next season is to put you in fire to establish the form. Okay, so I formed you into a vase, but then I take the vase and put it in the fire so that it can become strong. Because if I leave, if I form you, but don't put you in the fire, if anybody just taps you, you're going to lose your form. So I got to put you in the fire so you can get hard, so you can handle some stuff. Then I pull you out. Then I start decorating you. God doesn't decorate you until you establish enough to handle the decoration. He don't decorate you when he's forming you. He decorates you after you've been solidified and you've been matured. This is why you look at some people, you go, oh, my God, you're so blessed. What they want to say to you is, oh, if you only knew all the fires I've been through, what you see is the end product. But the reality is if you'd have met me five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have seen this. But you thank God that he graced you every day to get through what you've gone through so you could be where you are today that's why some of us have to praise God for where we are because if we didn't go through what we went through we wouldn't be where we are right now is there anybody in this 12 o'clock service that can say pastor I'm with you on that one if God didn't keep me then I don't know where I would be I would have lost it God what are you doing I came to tell you he is preparing you for more he's preparing you for greater and you should start getting excited about what's next in your life because God ain't forming you just because he has has nothing to do. He's forming you because he's getting ready to use you to do something great. Listen to me. Some people will try to put a price tag on you. I have a vase in the back. Uh, I thought about bringing it out for this illustration and uh, I left it back there, but it was interesting when I picked it up, there was a, uh, a price tag on it and it said $9.99. And I thought about it. I said, hmm. I said, I wonder if this vase could talk. And I could ask this vase, how much do you think you're worth? I don't think that vase is going to holler back at me and say I'm worth $9.99. See, other people will put a price tag on what they think you're worth, but not know everything you went through to be the person you are. Okay. Um, your value is far above rubies, right? That's the person who is saying that understands the value of a virtuous woman in that particular case in Proverbs 31, right? So when you know your value, more than just women, but just also men, when you understand your value, there's certain things you can't compromise. Okay, 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 okay. There's certain jewelry stores you go in, and all the jewelry is out in the open. 
There are other jewelry stores. It ain't at the counter. It's a room in the back and a bodyguard's at the door because what you think is expensive in one setting is cheap in another. See, some of y'all keep, see, <laughs> see, the problem is you, you, oh, Jesus, Lord, help me try to say this right. Mm. I, mm. I'm trying to figure out a nice way to say this because when we get ready to say it, it's about to be straight. Whew, that's rough. Um, I know how much you value yourself based on how many people put their hands on you. See, when you go to certain jewelry stores, everybody can touch them rings. There's certain rings, you, uh, you can't even touch that until you get to a certain caliber. Yeah, I missed it. Some people won't value you. That's why they try to handle you any kind of way. But when you are valued, they can't even walk in a room unless they got a certain amount of... <laughs> Going to one jewelry store, oh, that's nice, you bought that ring. Go to Cartier. Go, 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 go to Tiffany's. Go, go to other places. You'll see. Oh, okay. I remember when lady said I, last year she wanted a bag for her birthday, and I was saving up for the bag, and finally got the bag, and I was calling around different people because I'm trying to get surprises, and I called somebody. And this what the person said. Oh, Chanel's my friend right now. I said, look, I ain't got Chanel money. <laughs> Don't even bring up a Chanel. Okay. I was talking to somebody who had Chanel money. I ain't have Chanel money. So I'm not even considering Chanel. So there, the reason, oh my God, let me talk to some single sisters. The reason why you haven't found, that, that guy hasn't found you yet, because his mind ain't on Chanel level yet. When he get to Chanel, He'll find, yeah, he'll find you because at that point he'll be ready to handle you. And no offense to any brand, but you can't have somebody trying to handle a Chanel when you got a coach mindset. I'm sorry, you. Two different price range. Y'all not hear what I'm saying. I'm, I'm more, you're not going to talk to me that way. I'm more valuable than that. You're not, you're not going to handle me that kind of way. I know my value. You're not going to let her handle you any kind of way, brother, because you know your value. You're not going to disrespect me. I know who I am. When you know who you are, you, you don't allow people to handle you a certain kind of way. So what's your value? Oh, I'm not taking that. That's non-negotiable. Holler. Bye. Deuces. Right? Why? You know your value. What are your non-negotiables? God is saying, you worth more than $9.99. Don't allow a $9.99 mindset to mismanage a million dollar product. That's why you never let poor people count money. Thank you, Katrina. I appreciate that. <laughs> One supporter. I don't need you desperate. Okay, put it this way. You don't put a hungry dog in a meat house. That's better? Y'all got that one? So you don't, put, you don't put somebody in a place where they can't handle what they see. Because what they think is a lot to you is not much. What is God doing? Changing your perception. I know we have this word that we use all the time, hustle. I get it. But don't be a hustler your whole life. You may have to grind a little bit, I get it. But you don't have to grind your whole life. You may have to endure some stuff to get it done, I get it, but not your... Something has to change. What do you do when your body can't hold up anymore under that kind of pressure? I remember when I was 20, I would get up, just jump out the bed. 40, I get up just a little slower. And after that basketball game, ever so often my knee talks to me, and I'm like, 
But what's happening? Signs. You're not always going to be here. You have to consider what it's going to look like. Got to crush some stuff. What is God trying to change in you? God, what are you doing with my life? Glad you asked. He's starting over. <laughs> starting over. But where he starts is right here. Because wherever your head goes, your body follows. Everybody stand to your feet. When we bought this building, I think the membership was around, I think it was on 700 or so. And, um, and we had it situated where we had a much larger lobby. Actually, the building was actually flipped. The stage was supposed to be over there. And the lobby was here, but after realizing that all the parking was in the back, we had to make the front of the building, the back of the building, the back of the building, the front of the building. So that's how we had to flip it the way we did. And I remember in a meeting, someone said to me, he said, Pastor, the church bought this building and the building is too small. I said, no, it's not. It's not so small. It's fine. It's perfect. We will be fine. We'll be able to grow there. And we, when we moved in this building, it's already too small. Sometimes your perception will make you will influence your decision and you not realize that the thought process you have isn't the one you should have. But God says you won't see it until you get in it. So now some like, like you and myself, we're sitting here like, man, the building is too small. Let me tell you what I see. We eventually have to build again some kind of way, whether we add on this or another building. But let me, let me tell you what I see. I see children's ministry, teen ministry, which is middle and high school, and adult services all going on at the same time. Why do you say that? We have all these teenagers that come here. But they have football and basketball and soccer and after school programs and all other stuff after school. So only a small percentage of the kids who come here on Sunday come back on Wednesday. Well, we're missing being able to minister to them on the level they need. Right. We want to be able to give to our children. We may have the nursery we need. We want to be able to eventually reach our college students. But we need a larger facility. You can't do that. So either you build something larger or you kill the people. So what does that do for me? Wait a minute, God. I'm not ready for all that. Well, you need to get ready because in order for you to manage what you have to handle, you have to expand and you can expand without expense. So at the end of the day, listen to me. We could do this. In 10, 15 years, we're going to have a problem. Because those teenagers sitting out here now saying, I kind of understand what Pastor Sim's saying, but it really ain't connect with me. And when they become adults, when they're 25 and when they're 24 and when they're 23, you know what's going to happen? They won't be in church because the brook didn't meet their need. At the end of the day, I'm 40, got 50. I don't know how many more years God would have me do this. But come on, I ain't going to be doing this forever. And I don't plan on being up here at 65 trying to hold on to something. I want to be able to pass this on to whoever's next. Does that make sense? So that's the pastor inside. But what are you doing for your life? How are you structuring your life for what you, for what you need to, to make provisions for? God has to change the way you think. And sometimes, like myself, you're going to have to eat words you never thought you would have to eat. It's embarrassing to come back telling y'all, uh, <clears throat> we're going to have to build. Now, you said, I know I said that. But then God crushed me and said, embrace it. Because there's no way. Charlotte wasn't on my mind. Because go out into all the world was just going to the corner. 
go out to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That meant go downtown, go over the other side of town, and wear a nice t-shirt and say, do you know Jesus? Can I pray for you? That was evangelism. That was go ye into all the world. And so all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, you said the world. So the only people who knew Jesus in Colombia? Change your perception. So all of us are growing. But don't get stuck on a wheel and fighting going in the fire. Because he's trying to make you. Grab your neighbor's hand. We're going to pray. Father, I pray for everyone who's here today. On this Labor Day weekend, God, I pray that you will bless the hands that I hold. Bless my brother and my sister now. God, you see where they are. They have so many questions about what you're doing with their life. But God, let them know that you're doing something different in their lives. You're starting something new. Behold, I will do a new thing. We thank you, O oh God, for fresh starts, dreams and ideas, new contracts, new relationships. Got new moves, new strategy, new concepts got a new life a new mind that we leave here fresh and, re and just ready to take what you said belongs to us God we stand on your word now believing that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think blow our minds stretch us to be able to receive what you're trying to pour into us and God we are honor you for for all of it we trust you we believe in you. God, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord God. We trust that you will order our steps. And even though we fall, God, we thank you that you help us up each and every time. 